Thank you. Good morning. Um, I know that sometimes I am a little bit soft spoken. So if I'm not loud enough, please like do a little dance and wave at me so I can turn up the volume a bit. But I'll try and speak into the microphone pretty um, closely here. So um, I think sort of like Brian Richards this morning, I saw that my talk was titled uh, Chronic Wasting Disease Management in Wyoming. Um, which gave me a little bit of pause because the reality is, is I don't have a lot to talk about when it comes to actual experience with management for CWD in Wyoming. We have not really done a lot of management. And so I thought what might be a little bit more valuable to talk about today is really some of the things that we have learned about CWD in our state and some of the things that we have seen with CWD in our state, certainly dealing with this disease for quite a long time. So uh, John Fisher yesterday gave a fantastic overview of lessons learned at a broader scale. And I'm just gonna bring it maybe to a narrower scale as far as lessons that we have learned in Wyoming as a wildlife management agency. Um, and in some cases, we have really learned these the hard way. So again, I guess the uh, caveat that comes with this is I'm talking about Wyoming, which is certainly uh, in the West. And there are regional differences in what we see with chronic wasting disease. And when we're talking about CWD in the West, we actually are looking at pr probably more of a mule deer dominated epidemiology of disease. Um, and we're dealing with multiple susceptible overlapping cervid species. So in our CWD areas, we have white-tailed deer, mule deer, elk, and moose that are all overlapping in the same area. So that's certainly a different factor. Um, <clears throat> we don't have anywhere near the density of cervids that it seems like you guys have out in this neck of the woods. In fact, I'm always just floored by uh, seeing the volumes of deer that folks are working with in the Midwest and in the East. Um, and we don't necessarily work with quite that scale. Um, but I guess Brian Richards this morning uh, mentioned that uh, deer are not migratory, and I guess it depends on your definition of migratory. Uh, we consider our cervid populations to be migratory, and we have actually seen migrations of up to 150 miles in deer. So we have quite a lot of movement in some of our cervid species, um, and that probably also impacts what we see with chronic wasting disease. So I can really only talk about what we've seen in Wyoming, and I guess take that with a grain of salt, recognizing that there are some regional differences with this disease. As far as CWD in Wyoming, uh, we don't know when it really truly first arrived. Our first case of chronic wasting disease was in our captive research facility, and that was identified in 1979 by Dr. Beth Williams. And I think, like a lot of other folks have mentioned, your first identified case is rarely the first actual case. And that probably even held true for us in our captive facility, because of course, before 1978, we didn't even know what this disease was or what to look for. As far as our free-ranging populations, our first mule deer case was in 1985, and our first elk case in 1986. So we have had this disease in Wyoming for a very long time. Uh, and it has been a very interesting uh, learning experience, I think, working with this disease. So as I mentioned, I don't have a lot of words of wisdom for you on chronic wasting disease management. So Wyoming has never done any on the ground directed management for CWD in our populations. Um, we do have carcass movement restrictions in place. We do try whenever possible to get out in the field and remove animals that look sick and remove those animals from the landscape. And then I guess another important consideration when talking about Wyoming is that um, we actually do not have a captive cervid industry in Wyoming. Um, captive cervid facilities were banned from Wyoming and we just have one grandfathered in elk farm in Wyoming. So when we're talking about CWD in Wyoming, um, we're not talking about captive cervids at all. It's really just free ranging wildlife. So while we have not done significant management on the ground, we certainly have done surveillance and monitoring for quite a long time. Uh, I think probably like a lot of agencies, we separate our surveillance into kind of three categories. We look at hunter harvested animals and that helps us look at some rough estimates of prevalence. Um, we look at roadkill animals and uh, we look at targeted animals. So those animals that look sick 
or uh, were found dead that we suspect have a higher likelihood of chronic wasting disease. And in our, in our experience, the roadkill surveillance and that targeted surveillance has been quite beneficial uh, for detecting disease in new areas. Um, even for us with a long history of CWD, a lot of times, especially on the western front of where we've seen CWD, um, we will first identify cases through targeted and roadkill surveillance, often before that hunter harvested, so that's beneficial. Um, I'm not sure if any other agency does this, but we actually do all of our own chronic wasting disease testing in-house in our own wildlife health laboratory. And we do return results to our hunters within three weeks. Um, our biggest limiting factor when it comes to getting results turned around for CWD is really getting the samples in from the field. Once we get them into our laboratory, we can do the testing pretty quick and turn that around, but um, folks in the field are busy, and so oftentimes they're batching and sending those in. So that's why we have a three-week turnaround. And really, this is surveillance of wildlife populations. So as John Fisher mentioned, you know, we don't see this as a food safety test, although we do test um, animals if hunters request us to. So between 1982 and 1996, we did do a small little bit of surveillance, and that was really as just collaborative work with Dr. Beth Williams in that initial evaluation and research into chronic wasting disease. But that was obviously very limited. Um, both in uh, region, so it was really one small area that we were doing that, and of course our sample sizes were incredibly small with that work. Our agency surveillance program really began in earnest in 1997, and then of course once we had federal funding, we were able to get quite a lot more samples um, and start to get a better feel statewide for where the disease existed. And then of course after we lost federal funding, uh, surveillance did drop off a fair bit. Now, I guess I also have to give the caveat when you look at our information and the samples that we get, you know, we're thrilled if we get 5,000 samples. Um, but you have to take that into context because our annual cervid harvest is probably somewhere between 70 and 80,000 animals, um, which is so different from what I see coming out of the East and the Midwest. I can't believe you guys harvest that many deer. Um, but our harvest is a lot lower and our seasons actually span from August through to the end of January. Um, so we're kind of out there a long time and getting samples can be quite difficult and just requires a lot of boots on the ground to be out there and get some of these samples. So you gotta take it with a grain of salt as far as what we are able to achieve uh, in Wyoming versus what you guys are able to achieve here because I hear about people getting 20,000 samples in a weekend and I cannot even imagine doing that. <laughs> uh, that's just not possible for us to do. So as we've looked at our data, and as we've looked at what we're seeing across the board, both with our own surveillance information as well as with the research that is coming out of our state and just recent research in general on chronic wasting disease, is that Wyoming's deer populations are facing a growing threat from chronic wasting disease. And we as an agency are quite concerned by what we're seeing. And you may have noticed um, in 2016, our surveillance uh, bumped back up again to around 3,000 samples. And that is because we're starting to put, again, a more directed and increased effort on chronic wasting disease in our state to try and start to understand what is truly happening with our populations and what we need to do about it in the future. So in 1997, this is what we knew about the distribution of chronic wasting disease in Wyoming. I give you the caveat that this is small, small regional sample sizes, and I do not think that this is representative of where CWD truly existed at that time. This is just what we knew in 1997. By 2003, uh, we had a lot more data, we had some federal funding, we were getting a lot more samples, we were sampling statewide, and we were starting to get a better feel for where CWD actually existed in our state. By 2010, we felt like we were probably seeing some real spread of the disease and certainly had a lot more data at that point. And by 2016, 2017, this is sort of where we are with distribution of chronic wasting disease in our state. Um, those areas that are outlined in dark blue are new areas in the last two years. Um, and I guess uh, just for a frame of reference, so when we are looking at CWD occurrence in our state, we look at it by hunt area or like a management unit. Uh, we're not looking by county. So some of the federal maps that you see go by county. And the reason these look different is because it's by our, our hunt areas um, and our management units. So we've seen chronic wasting disease spread 
across the majority of our state at this point. Um, and of course, even with what we do know in the sampling we've done, it's not perfect. So we suspect it probably we have it in more places than even is depicted on this map. Um, and we're quite concerned to see how much CWD that we truly have. And beyond seeing the disease spread across most of our state, we are seeing prevalences increasing uh, quite a lot. So when we look at southeastern Wyoming, um, we have sort of our core endemic area where we feel like we've had CWD the longest. So that's kind of in this area here. And in this area, prevalences are all over 20%. We have prevalences over 30%. We have prevalences over 40%. And so we certainly are seeing a lot of CWD and we're seeing that prevalence increase. And even in areas surrounding our core endemic area where for a long time we didn't really think much was happening, as time goes on, we are seeing prevalences increase um, in some of these areas, in our big corn basin, in some of these areas, we're seeing quite high prevalences um, and we're seeing this kind of continue to increase, which is really, quite concerning. Um, and I'll give you the caveat, this is just um, data. So when we track occurrence, we track occurrence by our management units. When we track prevalence, we kind of look at the actual herd unit or population unit. And our data is not perfect. Um, our surveillance samples are obviously low. And so our prevalence estimates are rough. And in this case, we actually combine multiple years of data in order to give a very rough prevalence estimate. So I give you those caveats. So we've seen CWD spread across our state. We've seen prevalence increase. And we now have research coming out of our own state to suggest that we're seeing population declines associated with chronic wasting disease in Wyoming, where prevalence is really high. And this is very concerning. Um, and uh, Brian mentioned this this morning, the South Converse mule deer herd. Um, and so this is an area in southeastern Wyoming. We consider it part of our core endemic area. And in this mule deer population, and I guess in case you can't see, um, this is our annual postseason population estimate. And then, of course, the red line is it's actually a three-year running average of our prevalence. So I know when um, Brian showed some of this data, you saw, especially uh, in later years, really wide variation. Um, our harvest is so low in this population right now that it's really hard for us to get surveillance samples. So we're kind of combining years to get a more of a running average of what we're seeing prevalence wise. And so it's common for us, at least in Wyoming and in a lot of areas in the West, to have harsh winters and weather events that impact our populations. And um, I think you can kind of see that here where you get a big crash um, and that's associated with a weather event. Normally when that happens, we tend to see these populations rebound pretty quickly. Um, but in this herd, over time, we started to not really see rebounds occurring at the level we would expect to. And as our managers were out looking at this herd and looking at um, classifying deer in this herd and flying for this herd, not only were they seeing populations numbers decline, they were not seeing uh, good fawn recruitment. We just weren't seeing as many fawns as we would expect compared to other herds across the state. And when they would fly in this population, and look, this is a population that was very conservatively managed. And in a lot of cases, um, uh, it was managed for more of an older age buck and a trophy buck. And yet we were not seeing those older age class bucks. They were not seeing a good age structure like they would see in other areas. And so our folks started to wonder whether the extremely high prevalence that we had in this population was actually really having an impact. And that's where um, we were really lucky enough to get to work with folks with University of Wyoming. And um, they did some pretty phenomenal research in this area. So Dr. Malia DeVivo did work with this particular mule deer population, the South Converse herd. And um, I'm not gonna go into great detail with this because it's not my research, but um, they were looking at a possible 19% annual decline in that population associated with chronic wasting disease, uh, which was really concerning. And she had some data to suggest that maybe we're actually seeing some genetic shift as well. Um, and I think there's more research that we're gonna need to do in that area, which we're, we're working on now. But um, that data is quite concerning. And then Dr. Dave Edmonds actually did a study in a white-tailed deer population um, in the same management area, but not overlapping with this population. And that white-tailed deer population, when they really looked in depth at it, 
they were thinking that we might be seeing a 10% annual decline in that population. And that's where buck prevalence was maybe around 30%. Um, so we really have some pretty direct evidence in our state that we are seeing CWD spread. We are seeing prevalence increase and we are seeing population level effects due to this disease, which is really, really concerning for us. And I think one of the reasons, at least for us in the West, get very concerned is actually mule deer. Um, and so mule deer are very prized in our state and we're working really hard to maintain really good, robust mule deer populations. And across the West, mule deer populations have struggled at times and um, they're certainly not as easy to grow as white-tailed deer. And there are a lot of factors that impact these populations. And there are a lot of areas where we're managing our mule deer incredibly conservatively, trying to grow those populations and struggling to grow those populations. And our concern is, is once you add CWD on top of all of that other stuff, um, it starts to become overwhelming for these populations. And we do worry about the future of our mule deer when it comes to chronic wasting disease. So I know I've talked a lot about deer and a lot of messaging about deer. And um, the really fantastic uh, Dr. Jenny Powers with the Park Service made this comment when she was talking about some of their work with elk, that elk are not big deer. And that certainly holds true for what we've seen in Wyoming as well. So we just have not seen um, the same picture in elk that we have in deer. So this is our current sort of distribution and prevalence estimates in elk for chronic wasting disease. So as you can see, distribution is far more limited. Um, I think some of that is real, and I think some of that is also sampling associated. Um, we just don't have quite as much elk data as we do deer data. So um, it's possible that we do have CWD in a little bit more elk areas than we think. But in our prevalence estimates, um, we just aren't seeing the same picture that we do with deer. So again, if we look in our core endemic area and we kind of look like our Laramie Peak elk population, um, mule deer in this area have a CWD prevalence in bucks somewhere in the ballpark of 25%. Um, but this elk population, and we do really monitor this elk population every year, we get pretty good sample sizes, and they're somewhere in the ballpark of 6 to 8%. Um, and I guess the short answer to this question of why this occurs is we don't really know. Um, I know we've had some conversations about this yesterday. I thought it was really interesting. Um, I don't know that genetics alone truly accounts for what we see. Um, life is never simple, so there's probably multiple factors that um, cause the impact that we see in elk versus in deer. Um, but I do suspect in some cases, uh, management probably also plays a role in what we've seen in elk versus deer. So the reality that we have come to is that uh, chronic wasting disease is impacting hunting in Wyoming today. And so we do know that we have areas where in high prevalence, we are having population declines. Our South Converse mule deer population has declined by over 50%. And that has led to less access. We don't harvest any does out of that population. Our harvest is much, much lower. It is impacting opportunity to hunt in Wyoming. And we have some other more anecdotal data, so I would take it with a grain of salt, that we seem to see some differences in um, age structure of some of our populations where we have a lot of chronic wasting disease. And we do suspect that that is another uh, factor that we're seeing with CWD in our state. Um, so this is also quite concerning for us. I guess one of the other lessons we learned and and I, I don't even know if I needed to talk today because I think other folks have really covered a lot of this stuff, but messaging matters. So, you know, the majority of CWD positive animals that are harvested in Wyoming appear completely normal and appear completely healthy. And when we talk to hunters who have harvested a positive animal, one of the most common things we hear is there is no way that animal is sick. It's the fattest deer I've ever seen. It was perfectly healthy. Your test must be wrong. And so, we, we have kind of realized that we really need to pay attention to how we message this disease and recognizing that we have a long period where animals are uh, infected but appear completely normal. And for us, you know, we've always kind of had that in the text of our fact sheets and things like that, and we've always tried to write that. But, you know, we started to realize that every fact sheet, every website, um, every news release that comes out about chronic wasting disease has a photo like this. 
And regardless of what we put in the text, this photo has a much stronger message. And so we've had to really rethink how we message chronic wasting disease to make sure that our hunters are aware that this is not necessarily the only thing you would expect to see with chronic wasting disease. And it's tough because sometimes you want to message this to your hunters, you want them to call you if they see this so that you could come and remove that animal, but we really want them to recognize that the majority of animals with CWD that are harvested look normal and you cannot tell. Um, so that's an area certainly that we've really had to learn and we've really changed the way we put together some of our information materials around chronic wasting disease and we don't put these photos out quite as often as we once did um, and really focus on photos and images of actually healthy looking deer um, because that's probably the reality for what folks are going to see. So probably I guess when we're talking about lessons learned the most important lesson we've learned is the timeline. So Dr. Fisher mentioned longer than you think. And we have certainly learned that lesson in Wyoming. The impacts of this disease are not measured in years, they're measured in decades. And for us at least, this was a hard lesson to learn. Um, and this is a very hard concept, I think, to get past um, both your agency and your public and your stakeholder groups. And you know, the reality was when we first found CWD in our state in the 1980s, we didn't know a whole lot about it. It was kind of a curiosity, you know, did some research, years went by, did some more work, years went by. And by the time I think a lot of other areas were really ramping up chronic wasting disease, we had had that disease, at least known we had had that disease for more than a decade. And at that time, we were not seeing an impact in our populations. We were not seeing a change. Uh, we knew that we were probably losing animals to CWD, but we couldn't measure any true impact. And it was really difficult to think about putting in really strict management or difficult management when a lot of our folks really weren't sure that this was truly going to have a negative effect on our population. It was really a tough thing to sort out and unfortunately for us you know it took us 30 years of known CWD before we could measure that impact and we are seeing that now and the reality is is uh, messaging this slow moving insidious disease it creeps up on you is difficult and trying to message this out is difficult because I think you get CWD in a new state or new jurisdiction and you get really worried and there's a lot of effort and a lot of things go on and five years go by and your public doesn't see anything. Nothing happened, no big deal. What's going on? Why are you freaking out? And how do you message that? You know, we are looking at deer for tomorrow and we are really trying to look towards the future and you're not gonna see a difference in five years, but we're worried about 30 years or 50 years from now. Um, so anybody who's figured out how to do that successfully, I would love to hear from you because even though we have a long history of the disease in our state, we still have areas that do not have a long history and it's just kind of moving into those areas and we're, we're struggling to message that and I think probably all of us are struggling because it's a difficult concept to get past. It was difficult for us. Um, and so I think that's probably our most important lesson that we have actually learned and we've learned it the hard way. So now that we're trying to think about what do we do about this, for us, the real reality is, and we've talked about this a fair bit, I think, over the last two days, is um, it, it's not going to be easy. We do not think that we have the ability to eliminate or eradicate chronic wasting disease. So when we're talking about management and our agency has made a commitment to manage for CWD in Wyoming, we look at this as a very, very deep commitment and it is going to require a lot of work and support in order for us to achieve anything. And the reality is, is we're probably looking at a permanent commitment if we're going to look to manage for CWD and if we're going to look at not managing for eradication or elimination, but harm reduction in our populations. <laughs> 
So last year we did update our chronic waste and disease management plan, um, and it may not seem like much, but you know, for the first time we do have a stated goal to reduce the rate of spread, reduce prevalence of CWD in our state. Um, we have a lot of sort of general things that of course we're gonna do, keep carcass um, import restrictions and movement restrictions, continue to not move deer. We do not move deer in our state or any cervids. Um, <clears throat> support research, information education, you know, all of these generic things. But the reality is when it comes to what are we actually going to do to manage for CWD, uh, we, we don't know yet. So while we have a long history with this disease, um, we're in the same boat as you guys. We are actually just starting to figure out what are we going to do and how are we going to really approach this in our state. We do think that chronic wasting disease is a deer management concern in our state. We do believe we are seeing population impacts from this disease in Wyoming. And as we look at potentially managing for it, we recognize that we are gonna need huge commitment and support in order to achieve any potential management. We believe that um, hunters are probably going to be crucial for us to approach any type of management for CWD. We do believe that anything we do is going to require an incredible long-term sustainable commitment and approach. And we're just at the beginning. So we're beginning with communication because for us as an agency, we are actually making a pretty substantial shift in messaging around chronic waste and disease and what we're seeing. And that's a difficult shift to make. Um, and so we're beginning at the beginning with communication. We're going slow. As we talk about how to approach actual management and what might we do and how would we approach that, we've really come to the conclusion, which I'm sure most folks here have, um, we're not going to be successful alone. Uh, we're not going to do this alone. We're not going to find an answer alone. And if we're going to find management that potentially helps us reduce the harm of CWD, we are going to need to work together and we are looking at ways to go with a more regional approach to chronic wasting disease. So through the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, we are actually drafting some recommendations for adaptive management for chronic wasting disease with the understanding that any management we do, especially in areas that have a long history of CWD, is really going to be somewhat experimental and applied. And we're trying to draft some recommendations for what things we might try and how to apply it in such a way that we can measure results and hopefully potentially compare results with the hope that if we focus on a regional approach to this disease, we might be able to share support, share resources, and perhaps start to find some management strategies that work. Um, but we are actually just beginning. Uh, so with that, certainly there are a lot of folks that uh, work within our agency that do an incredible amount of work for chronic waste and disease. And I think probably most notably is our wildlife health laboratory who does amazing work. And they're in the process right now of becoming an all-in certified laboratory to continue our testing program, which is uh, not an easy feat by any means. And certainly our field personnel collect samples for us every day, ask important questions. Um, and University of Wyoming has done some really critical research that have helped us sort of understand what are we seeing with chronic waste and disease in our populations. So with that, uh, I know we don't have any time for questions, but thank you very much. And uh, hopefully the rest of the talks are maybe a little bit more enlightening than this one. <laughs> uh -huh.